Hi. Thanks for coming after afternoon tea. Um, I'm going to do my own intro. Uh, I gave a talk in here uh, earlier. How many people came to that? Hands? Yeah? Lots? Not everybody. So I'll do another intro. Um, I think it's important for me to also tell you about some credentials I don't have, which are that I am not a psychiatrist or psychologist. I am not a medical doctor. I'm not licensed. Um, if I give you advice, uh, you should be very careful about taking it. Um, but with that, I think that we should, uh, we should soon get into some therapy. Um, so uh, I'm on the Twitter. Uh, most of you already saw that, uh, and most of you already heard this joke about email, so we'll just skip right past that. Uh, but if you do want to reach me, these are the ways to reach me. And thanks to Pivotal for, uh, for bringing me here. I work for them. If you want to hear about things that Pivotal makes, including lots of great open source software like RabbitMQ or Apache Geode or Cloud Foundry, you know, we could do that some other time. So this talk is more like the five stages of Cloud Native. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. <laughs> I heard it begrudgingly, quietly. But yes, acceptance. So have a seat on the couch. You can come forward if you want to, but I request that if you do, you do it more like a zombie. But a zombie who has somewhere to be. So a little quickly. So, you know, so just sit there however it makes you comfortable. And let's talk about some basic ground rules. First of all, no weird family stuff, no childhood stuff. We're not going to get into any of that. But we will talk about your delivery pipeline. We will talk about how you get something from uh, the developer's brain and hopefully laptop to production. Uh, we'll talk about your architecture, because it matters to have a decent architecture. And we'll talk about your automation, because you should automate things. So let's start the clock. And this is where you say, deploying my apps to the cloud is so painful. Why is it so painful? Does this resonate with anyone? Getting shit out the door is so painful. Oh, wow, almost nobody. You should go to a different talk. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with denial. Um, in this talk, we're going to talk about anti-patterns. So what we're going to do is walk through you know, what it feels like to start from we're not cloudy and maybe end up to a place where not only are you cloudy, but you're happy about it. So the way this usually begins is by saying, well, I don't, I don't need any of this stuff. Why are you trying to make my life worse? I've heard about this container stuff. So why don't we just treat containers like tinier virtual machines, right? So when we're first introduced to containers, one of the ways that we're introduced to them is through uh, saying, you know, it's really just like a virtual machine. Uh, you put a file system together, and then you can just put a lot of little virtual machines on another virtual machine, on a hypervisor, on some hardware somewhere. So one of the first anti-patterns that I want to talk about is really just do not assume that the ideal for going to the cloud is to take the stuff that you already have running that's difficult to deploy, difficult to manage in production, that you're building golden images for, that you're SSHing into your, into your production servers and tweaking by hand. I had, <laughs> I had a chat with a couple of folks over T um, who said, well, but how do I debug something in production if I don't have a user account with all my scripts in it? I can SSH into. And the answer is that you just don't have that anymore. And we'll talk about how to, how to get there. But do not treat the idea of um, containerization as a series of uh, tinier VMs. Um, so, so if I ask you to raise your hand uh, for how many people would say that they understand what a container is? Because I know we hear a lot about containers, right? OK, so how many of you think that a container is Docker. Awesome. Oh, except for you, not awesome in the back there. <laughs> I can't believe you. Why would you raise your hand? Anyway. <laughs> I mean, you saw everyone in front of you. Anyway. Uh, so, so just a container is, is a file system, a root file system. And then you wrap over that root file system some metadata about the constraints for how it, one process will run where that process's file system is given to you. So you have one process, 
Uh, you have one file system and some metadata about its operational expectations. It has memory constraints, potentially CPU constraints, network constraints, all that sort of thing. Um, so that's really powerful if we talk about it in the concept of processes, because then uh, you're, talking about, um, you're talking about what we discussed a little earlier today, which is you know, this idea of a 12-factor of a app being inside of a 12-factor container. And then you've got uh, a service that is repeatable, reliable, and resilient. And I'm not going to redo my talk from, from earlier, but, uh, but suffice it to say, um, the idea here about running things in the cloud and running them with uh, large-scale orchestration isn't about just easily cramming virtual machines on more virtual machines. So we don't need to automate continuous delivery. Um, I worked at a place where we had a release engineer, uh, release engineering manager. We had a whole team doing release engineering. And uh, she had about a 100-point checklist for how we deploy our app. And I wanted to automate that so that it was repeatable and potentially took less human time. And I heard, uh, I heard the explanation that we can't do that because it breaks every time. And the denial that was in this particular statement was that we can't deliver software using a 100-point automated or a 100-point manual checklist that we that we are very careful about, we think. Um, we can't automate that because it's broken now, and we shouldn't automate it until it's perfect. So what I would say to this is, it's not about uh, automating for the sake of ma magically making things perfect, but rather, automating is a way to make things consistent. So even if you have a slightly broken process now, if you automate it into a repeatable process, at least it's consistently broken. It breaks the same way every time. You can fix it once, and then it'll break a different way the next time. But at least you fix that one time, and you know, and you know you fixed it, right? So uh, this is a point where you know I'm not talking about AWS. I'm not talking about platforms in particular. Um, doing things in a, in a cloud way, where you want to be sort of quote cloud native, means uh, tying together continuous delivery with, um, with a, uh, an operationally mature production infrastructure environment. So it's a lot more, I would say, about how you get your code from the developer to production then, um, than how it's running in production, which is still important, but, um, but only part of, the, part of the puzzle here. So, oh yeah, not automating continuous delivery. Did I already have that? Yeah, it's so important that I put it there twice. So, we're denying, you know, we get from denying some of the reasons why we want to do cloud native, which are part of these anti-patterns. And, and if, you, if you attempt to, say, shove things into AWS and then do microservices without a continuous delivery pipeline, you're just exponentially increasing the amount of pain that you're giving yourself. So definitely, definitely automate away. So then anger. <laughs> we talked about this before, I guess. Uh, so it works on my machine. Uh, as an engineer, um, I've built an application, and it's beautiful, and it's perfect, and my unit tests on my laptop told me that. Uh, so when it's running in production and it starts breaking down, um, that's, that's your fault. It's not my fault. So obviously, this cloud that you've given me, this automated infrastructure, uh, the reasonable monitoring, maybe Jenkins, something like that, um, it's, it's your fault, not mine. So what I want to do uh, to fix that is I'm just going to hit git push Heroku for my dev box, and it's going to be magic. Um, I have an operator friend, a, a coworker of mine, actually, uh, Bridget Crumhout, uh, works with me on my team, on our team. She doesn't work for me. Um, and she says this all the time, that what she expects is happening anytime developers say that they want to deploy on their own is that they're just yellowing shit out, of, out into production. And if we're honest with ourselves, as developers, that's true. So um, pushing things to, um, to automated infrastructure and 
having the ability to auto-provision, say, services or auto-provision virtual machines, uh, or if you have an elastic runtime or elastic uh, computing situation, uh, being able to automatically add workloads to it, um, that doesn't give us permission to just put whatever we want in production because we can do it quickly. It's not about you know, making, uh, making worse code go to production faster. It's about reducing risk while increasing throughput. So the entire point of this exercise is to be able to deliver value faster with reduced risk. So you still need your automated pipeline. You still need your automated testing. You still need green builds. You still need a reasonable, repeatable, and, uh, and, and like vetted you know, release process. You can't get away from that, right? Bargaining. So how about, rather than decomposing our application into a reasonable architecture, into a service-oriented architecture. We know we have a monolith, but it's going to be too costly to do something like that. So what we'll do is just cram it into a container, and then it, and then it runs on Docker, so obviously it's modern. And we'll, but we'll call it a microservice, because I can, I can release that Docker container quickly. This is another thing that I see a lot. You can't just cram your old busted shit into a container and call it good. Right? You have to do something about it. Critical thinking is still required. So one of the biggest anti-patterns, I would argue this is one of the biggest anti-patterns because it makes you believe you're getting somewhere, is to do this, where you don't use critical thinking skills and figure out what parts of your application you need to retrofit. You need to refactor. Um, there's a term that people like to say these days, especially when you're going from a deplo one deployment strategy to another. For instance, if you're going from you know, bare metal to using you know, Chef or Puppet, and it's uh, replatforming. So I, I think it's a better word only for the business people because we've all overused the word refactor to mean that we're going to do something that matters to the business and it never really does and no one understands why. But replatforming has a specific goal in mind. So maybe give replatforming a shot the next time you say refactoring and somebody runs away screaming. This is one of my favorites. Who's heard this term, bimodal IT? Do, do you know where this came from? Gartner? Yeah, so Gartner are these, these uh, I guess they call themselves researchers or analysts. They're analysts. And Gartner's whole deal, I think, is to get you to drink their Kool-Aid. But they came up with this term. And their Kool-Aid is, is actually like top, top shelf gym martinis, right? Because they have, they have loads of money. But if you're drinking their top shelf gin martinis without Kool-Aid in them, then, uh, then you might subscribe to this idea of bimodal IT. The, the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to say that there's a fast lane and a slow lane. And that there's a modern way of doing things, that's the fast lane. And then there's, um, there's a, well, we'll call it less modern way of doing things, and that's the, the slow lane, or we'll say legacy. And there's a trap here um, that can be exploited. And the trap is, if you happen to have a team that you know should be on the fast lane, but they don't like that idea because it's too much change and it's terrifying for them, they can use biomodal IT as an excuse to not have to change. Secondly, it's a false dichotomy. Um, the truth is there's a whole spectrum of speeds that individual projects and applications need to go in depending on their needs. And if you want a good way to figure out what those needs are, it's how quickly you need to change that application. In software development, there's a, there's a term called legacy software. And for a long time, the standing, and I think it's still true, the standing definition for legacy software is um, anything that's not under unit test. Has anyone heard that? So anything that isn't tested is, is legacy software. Another definition from the, from the audience is stuff that still works. I like that. Stuff that pays the bills, maybe. So I would argue for a different definition, because I think that's too focused on uh, software development and not focused enough on the software delivery lifecycle, the, the idea of getting things out to production, which is the whole point of what we're doing here when we work for organizations that want to ship software. And uh, the definition that I would like to offer you is anything that you can't iterate on quickly enough. 
I think that's legacy software. So don't let you know, someone in a suit tell you, we're going bimodal IT as an excuse to carve off a bunch of projects that they just don't want to deal with if those projects aren't able to be iterated on quickly enough. That means they're hot. They need, they need work, and they need automation. They need good processes. They need good tools, right? Let me check my time here. Ooh, we're doing OK. So what if we create microservices that uh, all talk to the same data source? I like to call these Hydra services. Because then you've decided that your API for your core infrastructure is just your database. It's SQL or you know, whatever else you have besides SQL. And, uh, and the truth of the matter is then you have no source of truth for certain types of information. When you suddenly have multiple, inter multiple uh, data sets, or sorry, multiple applications interacting with the data set. So uh, this is usually a step on the journey toward service-oriented architecture or microservices that folks like to take. We'll spin up a few extra Rails apps, but we'll just let them talk to the same database because it would be too difficult to actually make APIs for these things to talk to. That's, that's, that's not good. Depression. We made 200 microservices, but we forgot to set up Jenkins. <laughs> My life is over. So this is where you take one problem and you make it 200 problems. Right? Uh, this is another case for continuous delivery. The ability to deploy anytime you want to that's verified by green, you know, good builds every time you make a change. You have to get there. We've built an automated build pipeline, but we only release twice a year. So this is a perfect example of a local optimization. The idea that you've made your development team go really quick because you, you, you did Agile and it was magic and you sang Kumbaya at your stand-ups and then suddenly your development team is moving quickly. But they're piling work up in front of your release team. And your release team automated the hell out of their work and they use Jenkins and aren't they great? But then your business is uh, institutionalized, maybe because IT or someone else has decided it's too risky to change, that you have to change within certain windows. So you just have work backed up. And any work that is backed up and not released is risk. Acceptance. We just have to admit it. We have to accept it that all software sucks, even the software that we write. Right? It's just not good. It could be, but, it, but it's not. We have to respect the cap theorem. The cap theorem is the idea that um, you've got, oh shoot, I'm blanking on the cap theorem. You have to pick two of these things. You have partitioning, availability, and consistency. Thank you. And you should look this up. I don't have time to jump into all of it. But with the cap theorem, you only have two of those things. So if you want consistency and partition tolerance, you might have to give up availability, right? These are just real things. You have to respect Conway's law, that your application and its architecture will mirror the organizational and communication structures of your company, of your organization. So if you have big silos in your organization and you don't talk to each other and work is constantly falling on the floor, what's happening between your subsystems that you're writing? Probably the same thing. So we need small batch sizes because they work for replatforming too, small incremental change. So while you know, going all the way to the cloud and having some beautiful delivery pipeline that, that gets small work out the door, quickly is the ideal, it may take you a long time to get there, and we have to be willing to accept that. So automate everything. And I suppose our time's up. So what have we learned? If there's one takeaway, I want you to remember this. Operability, being operable as a business, as a company, as an organization, and then also as software at the same time. It's about having a good architecture. I think microservices are all right for that. It's about having a good culture, and I think that the, the continuous learning and collaboration of DevOps is a good way to get there. And you need continuous delivery, and you have to pick three. You have to have all three. You can't let one go. So don't focus on your production infrastructure, but not automate your delivery pipeline. And don't focus on delivering your, 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 your pipeline in an automated way without considering whether or not your architecture is serving you well, because some architectures resist the ability to deliver quickly. So we want to change that. And I don't think we actually have time for questions, because it is exactly 4 o'clock. But we should be friends on Facebook or in real life. Sorry, on Facebook, on Twitter, or in real life. And uh, if in real life, it should be 
uh, with a pint tonight. So thank you very much.